Last week, we focused on the connection we have with Jesus and the church. This week, we continue along those lines and consider how the church can be intentional about helping people build their relationship with Jesus and his family. Welcome to Run With Horses. My name is Norman, and my goal is to help you thrive as a follower of Jesus. The spiritual life is both incredibly simple and potentially the most difficult part of your life. God invites you to live intentionally and on his mission. It's very cool that we can do that together. Thank you for joining me today. If you're new to the show, you may want to check out our website, runwithhorses.net, and listen to some of the past shows to catch up. I've spent several shows focusing on a simple definition of the church, and this conversation today will best be understood in the context of the church. And now, on with the show. We want to begin today thinking about, or continuing to think about, habits that we need to develop that will help us as we grow in Christ. One of those habits is community. We really need to invest in and stay invested in our local church, our community. Uh, Acts 2, 41 to 47 is an interesting passage when we think about the church. It says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Well, this is a an interesting passage in that it it talks about the early church and the flow of life. So you see in here they met both in the temple and house to house. They ate together. They really focused on the apostles' doctrine, which would be, this is what Jesus said. So really, you're talking about a focus on, in our case, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and what Jesus had to say, with probably some uh, extension into the Old Testament as Jesus had taught them about the fulfillment of Scripture uh, in His life and then now in the church. Uh, And then you see that they... They prayed in their their fellowship. So one of the things we have to ask is, how are we doing that today? Uh, How well are we doing those things today? Uh, It's important to recognize that we are connected in a special way as a church. Romans 12, 4 and 5 says, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. So we're connected in a unique way as the church. The Holy Spirit does that. Uh, We are baptized into this body of Christ, the universal church, and then we have the opportunity to join together with a local body, a local church. Ephesians 2, 19 and 22 also speaks to this idea of this new connection that we have. It says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So again, we have this idea that we are being built into something special. We're united for a reason, for a purpose, by God. And the question is, how well are we doing at living out that life of Christ in community? It's an important question. And it is it is answered together, but each one of us individually has to stop and consider, what's my part? What's my role? How am I doing at living out my gifts? Because the community is made up of its parts, just as the body is made up of its parts. It's not a full body without both legs, both arms, both ears. Well, can it function without some of those things? Yes. But is it all that it can and should be? Is it as it was created to be? No. And the church is the same way. It needs all of us, and that it means you. So to pick up, 
kind of where we have been thinking about the church. And I want to continue reminding you of my working definition of the church. And it's a working definition because I, I'm still open to changing it uh, and modifying it as we go forward. But so far, I'm happy that it encompasses uh, everything that it needs to for, for our purposes in thinking about the church, uh, particularly in the context of reproducing the church, multiplying the church. So a church is a group of followers of Jesus who worship Him in spirit and truth, humbly offering their lives as a living sacrifice, together living out the mission of Jesus as His witnesses to the world by sharing the gospel and making disciples through teaching obedience to His commands as they edify and equip others to join them on His mission. Along with that, we have recently been discussing and considering a discipleship pathway. And brief definition, the discipleship pathway is an intentional plan to equip others to be on the mission of Jesus. It is saying this is how we have agreed that we are going to live out this definition of the church together. This is how we're going to do what Jesus said that we need to do. Now, in thinking about the pathway and our purposes as the church, I think there are some goals of the pathway that are parallel to, or maybe even not parallel to, but are the way that we carry out the mission of Jesus in the church. So these would be goals, intentional goals of the pathway. Self-feeding Christians, meaning believers who are able to take God's Word, to read it, to understand it, and apply it themselves. They're not 100% reliant upon uh, the preaching. Preaching is great. I think you need that. But if that's all you ever get, then you're only getting fed uh, once or twice a week, and that's not sufficient. You need to be a self-fitting Christian, one who is consistently in God's Word. Uh, second, everyday missionaries. This is everyone on the mission of Christ. Uh, everyone takes Jesus' mission of the gospel to everybody and understands that's, that's my responsibility. And I have a, an area of influence, whether it's my family, my neighborhood, my workplace, where I, I buy groceries, my hobbies— I need to be taking Jesus with me to all of those places, to all those relationships. So everyone is an everyday missionary. And ultimately, we want these everyday missionaries to be disciple makers. That means they're able to help other people grow in Christ likeness, help other people to follow Jesus well. We want every person to be a disciple maker. So there's three things every believer needs to be. Self-feeding, an everyday missionary, and a disciple maker. And if we're doing that, then this fourth thing uh, should be a natural result. It means we have more pastors. We have sufficient pastors. If we're doing that work of being everyday missionaries, we're growing, we're becoming self-feeding Christians, and we're disciple makers, we're going to be discipling the people who will one day be the pastors of the church, the church planters and the missionaries, which should result in enough leaders that we have new churches. We still have places, even in the United States, where there are there aren't sufficient churches. Uh, we need new churches. We need new churches who are reaching into subcultures in different parts of the community. That's only going to happen if the existing church does its job as a disciple makers. And lastly, that all members of the church are shepherded well. This is tremendously important. If every person of the church is going to be shepherded well, taken care of when they're in need, that means we're going to need sufficient number of disciple makers, sufficient number of shepherds, sufficient number of people who are able to come alongside and encourage and build up and love on the people who need it. Again, where do we get those people? We need disciple makers in the church who are building them up. So we're thinking about this pathway and how we accomplish these things. So we're on the second step. We started that last time. Uh, the first step is engage. We spent a couple of shows thinking about what it means to engage in our community. Now we're thinking about connect, and there's two connections, one with Jesus and one with each other in the church. So today we want to continue kind of thinking through what it means to be connecting as the church, connecting with the church, and connecting with Jesus. So the church's role in connecting people to Jesus is incredibly important. Uh, for for one, a lot of people, uh, they don't grow up in a context where Jesus is part of the conversation. Uh, if they don't grow up in a Christian home, 
they don't have Christians who are part of their family or in their immediate environment, how do they hear about Jesus? They're not likely to go looking for a Bible without some kind of external motivation. Now, there are people who are looking for truth, who recognize that they have a problem, they have a need, and they go out looking and they come across a tract or they come across a Bible. They have that conversation that causes them to look. But over and over again, as we've looked at how people come to Christ, the statistics bear out that most people come to Christ through a relationship that they have with a believer. So what can we as the church do to intentionally help people connect their life, their values, and their purpose to Jesus? This includes the gospel, but it's not limited to that because when someone does uh, express faith in Him, accept His free gift of salvation, now they are uh, baptized into the church. They're part of this body, at least spiritually. Uh, They still have, if they've grown up outside of the church, they still have a life values and probably an understanding of their life that is not really in line with what God has to say. So how do they become uh, someone who does understand God's purpose, God's values, and the biblical meaning of their life? Well, I think this is where the church comes in. We need to intentionally help people as they become new believers. They're really infants, spiritual infants, spiritual children who need to be Uh, cared for. This is where the shepherding of the church is hugely important. What's the first step, the first thing that needs to happen? Well, I would say that the biblical teaching and preaching of God's Word is foundational. The Bible is the foundation that we build on. We need to make sure that we're intentionally uh, inviting people into a relationship with God through His Word. Uh, Biblical teaching and preaching is certainly a the foundational level for that. And some of the foundational things that are really needed would be things like our identity in Christ. And and I recognize that across the board for believers, uh, our identity is something that we struggle with. Even after some people have been saved for years, they still, because of human relationships, because of temptations, because of trials they go through, they still struggle with who they are and who God says that they are. So, There are three things to think about that I think are helpful. There's a lot of verses, and we're definitely not going to have the time to do this today. Maybe in a future show, we'll just focus on our identity in Christ. But today, uh, there are three things. We are accepted by God. Uh, That's a huge thing. So many people grow up in an environment, in a context where uh, maybe they didn't feel accepted by their family. They didn't feel loved. But to know that we are God's child that He has fully accepted us. Uh, He tells us we are His children. Uh, We call Him Father. Uh, That we're united both in Christ and with Christ. Uh, Along with the idea of being united, being God's child, is to understand, as Ephesians 2 talks about, uh, in the early part of chapter 2, verses 3 to 8, that we're chosen, God intentionally chose us, and that we're adopted into His family. Uh, God accepts us. He loves us. He chose us. And He completes us. So I'm complete in Christ. And look at John 4. We may not today be all that we ultimately will be, but we know uh, that we will be all that God intends for us to be. So a whole part of this discussion would be the work of sanctification in each person's life, that God has uh, set you apart. Uh, positionally, you are now His child. You're His child a joint heir with Christ. You're united with Christ. But in your life, you are still being sanctified. You still have this struggle with with sin. But ultimately, you will be completely sanctified, separated from sin, from temptation, from all those things. So there's three aspects to this work. But to know that in the middle of the struggle, I have that position. I am sanctified. And because of the work of Christ... I have direct access to God through Jesus. This is Hebrews 14, 14 to 16. Uh, You think about that high priest that we have that allows us to come to God boldly. Uh, He understands us. He accepts us. Uh, To know that you're accepted by God is a huge part of understanding, I think, the gospel, but also to understand our identity in Christ. It's a huge thing that a lot of people struggle with. So you're accepted, and you're also, that acceptance 
is based on Jesus, not yourself. So you're free from condemnation. You're secure in Christ. Uh, Romans 8, 1 and 2, John 8, 1 to 12. You, there's, that, there's therefore now no condemnation. Uh, you will never face that, that condemnation because of the work of Christ. He has stood in our place. He has accepted the consequence of our sins. So our positional sanctification is taken care of. Uh, to know that my salvation is secure because of Christ, not myself, because of Christ. And to know that my ability to live a life that is worthwhile and glorifying to God is also not in my hands, but in God's hands. Now, I know often on a show like this, I'm thinking about the things that we do have some control over, the choices that we do get to make. You know, God has given us the opportunity to choose Him, to choose to follow Him, to choose to be obedient. But God is at work in my life for His glory and for my good, Romans 8, 28. My ability to glorify God rests on God, not on me. And my ability to follow rules, to do well, it rests in God. It rests in the work of Christ. And we don't ever get away from that. So, my sanctification is secured on multiple levels, and my ability to do well in this life, again, is more about Jesus than it is about me. And along with that, as we're thinking about our life and the choices we make, my life is meaningful. It's significant. Uh, you know, I'm connected to Jesus. You think about John 14 and 15 and that call to abide in Christ. I've been called to bear fruit. And again, we remember... I don't bear fruit because I'm an awesome person. I bear fruit because Jesus is the fruit bearer. Because when we're connected to Him, when we abide in Him, then this is what happens. And He determines what that fruit looks like. I don't get to choose uh, how big, how much, what kind. God has done that. He is doing that. Part of His work of making me uh, what He wants me to be is to give my life a special meaning. And I can recognize that without pride. I'm His work. So uh, Ephesians 2.10, I'm God's workmanship. And He's prepared work for me to do. But I'm His workmanship. I'm His work. And He makes me what He intends for me to be. Uh, that should give me uh, great joy, one, to know that God has chosen me. He, ha he is building me. He's still doing that work in me. And ultimately, I will be this completed, beautiful work of God that will perfectly accomplish its perfect perfect uh, purpose. That should be comforting. I, I can't really mess that up because I'm not my work. I am God's work. Because of that, because of the work of Christ, because I'm God's work, because He's working in me, then I can approach God with absolute freedom and confidence as His child. Uh, that's an, an awesome, awesome uh, understanding that every believer needs. And this is part of what we as the church need to be helping new believers to understand. So how do we do that then becomes the question. Uh, along with that, the character and mind of Christ as someone grows in their identity uh, to understand Philippians 2 and that uh, humility that marked Christ, uh, His desire to glorify the Father, His obedience. All of that is part of our learning the character, the mind of Christ, because what we're going to be uh, learning as we continue to grow, as we continue to be part of the church, is that He's called us to follow Him. We've, we follow Jesus. This is what it means to be a disciple and to accept His mission. So how do we do that? And I think the way that Jesus did it uh, is the way that we are to do it. We are to have so Ephesians 2, 5 says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ. We're to have the mind of Christ. That humility of Christ is to, to guide us and lead in our decisions. It's to lead, lead and guide as we take on the mission of Christ. So Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20, as we uh, regularly go back to that and think about what it means to be and make disciples, to be and make followers of Jesus, um, teaching them to obey all that Jesus taught the disciples to obey. We have been handed down this mission. I, again, I, I love the way Paul talks about it, to be ambassadors of Christ. We've been handed this opportunity uh, to be part of something that's massively bigger than we are. 
well, how do we go about doing that? What does it, what does it mean to do that? Uh, I, I think there's a, a tremendous opportunity, but there's also a, a challenge, right? It's not something we can do ourselves. So we go back to very much the, the things we learn in the identity that we have in Christ. He is the one. We are His workmanship. Uh, he is the one that gives us the opportunity to be involved in His mission, and He is the one that glorifies Himself in this mission, and He is the one that bears fruit in this mission. But we do need to choose to be on His mission. So that's a whole nother discussion. And that's really uh, ultimately the topic of all of my shows is how, how do we be uh, a better disciple, a better follower of Jesus? Uh, and then another part of the, the biblical teaching and foundation that the church has to help with is just understanding healthy relationships. You know, the, the world today, uh, not just today, always, as God created us, we are made to be in relationship with other people. We are part of other people. So we need healthy relationships. We're united in Christ. We have a new family. But outside of that, we have relationships still with the world. You know, Jesus was called a friend of sinners. He, sinners. he didn't go around and just attack people who uh, weren't following God. He was trying to uh, draw them in to understand who God the Father is and why we should follow, follow them. So he built a relationship with people who were unlike himself, people who didn't agree with his theology. Um, how do we do, and again, this is the mission of Christ, how do we do at building those relationships with people who are not like us, who are outside the church? So ultimately, we have to answer the question, what does each believer need if they're to grow and become more like Jesus and to embrace the mission of Jesus as their own? And this is going to encompass all the things we've been talking about, their identity, uh, it's going to encompass their understanding of the character and mind of Christ. It's going to un- uh, encompass their understanding of the mission of Jesus. What is actually he? What is he doing? Uh, it's going to encompass their ability to build and maintain healthy relationships. And we often struggle with that. All of us often struggle with that. How do we do that? And I would say that uh, we have the biblical teaching and preaching, which is going to tell us a lot about those things, and some people can take that and run with it, but most people are going to need a little more involvement, a little more uh, hands-on, and that's where really the equipping and, and training are going to come in. Some of the things that we're going to, to need to help people with are going to be like spiritual gifts. Uh, the idea of spiritual, spiritual gifts, looking at Romans 12, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, and saying, you know, teaching, preaching, encouraging uh, giving all these different spiritual gifts that are part of the church. Uh, they're there for a reason. And I believe that God has given all of us a spiritual gift, and it's given for a reason so that we can help build up the church. Ephesians 4 uh, talks about that, how uh, all of our role is to help the church be all that God intends for it to be. So to learn about spiritual gifts and how that plays into the mission of Jesus. We want the church, the church to be mature enough to carry out His mission living out our gifts as part of that. So some kind of equipping and training is going to be part of that. It might be things like a spiritual gifts inventory the church gives as part of their discussion on uh, what it means to be the church, what it means to live these relationships, uh, the, the purpose of those relationships to build up the church, to build up the body for the uh, mutual edification, building up the body for the work of ministry. So that kind of teaching, uh, teach the truth, but also equipping and training people to carry that out. Some of the spiritual gifts are going to require some some extra skill training, perhaps. Uh, Someone that has the gift of of teaching is probably going to do a little better with a little training about maybe teaching methodology or some thoughts about how to take that gift and use it most effectively. Uh, Naturally, they may be very good at it, but with a few uh, tips and, and some support, they could do much better at it. So equipping and training might include things like the spiritual gifts. Might include the spiritual disciplines. Now often, depending on your, your church background, you might not talk a lot about the spiritual disciplines, but for someone to grow, the spiritual disciplines often provide a lot of support. There are, 
at least six that you can see very clearly that Jesus practiced. So at the very least, some people would say there's 22, 23 spiritual disciplines or more. Uh, but you can see Jesus practiced at least six. Prayer, so at least 25 times in the Gospels we read of Jesus praying. And according to Luke 5, 16, Jesus prayed often by himself. So he made a habit of praying. Fasting. Um, when Jesus started his public ministry, he took 40 days in the wilderness to fast. So physically, his body struggled with that. That's physically where we require food. But it's a spiritual practice, and it strengthens the spirit because we spend that time fasting, focusing on God. He spent time in public worship of God. That means worshiping God together. Um, Luke 4, 16 says that Jesus gathered on the Sabbath day in the synagogue. Said it was his custom to do that. So he had this time of public worship. And some people today don't like to do that. They say, well, I can do that at home. Well, you do need to worship at home. Uh, your whole life is worship. You know, Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about you're living your life as a living sacrifice. That is worship. But public worship is also part of that. Uh, Bible reading. Studying Scripture was obviously an important part of Jesus' life. You see in uh, Luke 2 that at the age of 12, he already was very biblically literate and able to, to hold these really good conversations with the teachers uh, in the synagogue. So Bible reading obviously was part of his life before that point. Uh, solitude, silence. Uh, Jesus regularly ministered in front of large crowds, but he also made a habit of getting away, spending some time to spiritually rejuvenate, uh, Luke 5, 16. In fact, uh, he encouraged his disciples at times, hey, let's come away uh, to a quiet place for rest, for that solitude, to get away from the crowds. So uh, you see him drawing away from the busyness of life at times. But that's balanced with he also came to serve. So Mark 10, 45, Jesus said his goal was to serve others, not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life for our benefit. So you see Jesus lived out a lot of these uh, spiritual disciplines. We may also have in equipping and training practical ministry skills. So we have to answer the question as we look at all of these and, and more, we don't have time for today, what training or skill does, skills does each believer need to carry out their role in the church and on the mission? It's not the same for every person, and that's often the problem is that as the church, we don't really have a pathway and we don't really uh, intentionally train people to walk through a progression toward greater service, and I think we benefit from doing that. So in the second half of the show, we're going to come back and continue thinking about what it means to develop this pathway and how the church can support the spiritual growth of each person. Be right back. Okay, as we continue in the second half of the show, we want to think about how the church in its discipleship pathway can help each individual uh, develop in their personal ministry. We all have uh, our, our corporate ministry. We have things that the church does together. But part of the thing that the church together does is help the individual understand you have a unique you ministry. There's a question you can ask that will help you. Two questions, really. The first one is, where has God placed you and who has God placed you with? You know, as you think about your story, who you are, uh, all that God has done in your life to this point, one of the things you should understand is that your individual story is part of a much bigger story. It's part of God's story. Your story ultimately is God's story. When we think about personal ministry, and I've said this multiple times, the way to start, I believe, is with your testimony. You have a certain story of how you began and at some point in time, you met Jesus and you were placed into his family. So all those things we talked about in the first half of the show, where we're thinking about our identity in Christ. All that happened to you. That's part of your story. And then your understanding of that has grown over time. That's your story continuing. Uh, hopefully you've gotten involved in ministry and you had opportunities to see other people be impacted by your story. What you recognize is your story is his story. God is working in you and through you in other people. It's important as we're thinking about our personal role in the church and our ministry that our individual story 
is a big part of the vehicle for telling God's story. And it's not about us. Uh, that's one reason why we think about testimony, and I, I really want to emphasize it's his story. Uh, it's very easy to think about our life and keep ourselves in the center. And I think we do struggle with um, meaning and value and purpose and all these things when we put ourselves in the center because so many things happen in life that seem to make my story harder. <laughs> and if I have myself at the center and say, well, my life is about me succeeding, I can fail, which means my story is a failure, a story of failure. But if my story is about God, uh, God is doing something in my failure. Uh, God works in uh, really interesting ways. God uses the difficulties, the trials in our lives to grow us. So if I understand that my story is really about Him, not me, then I ask different questions. And that really helps me evaluate the things that happen in my life a lot differently and really in a better mindset. I'm not asking in the middle of a trial, God, get me out of this. I'm saying, God, teach me the lesson. Help me to see what you're doing here. Maybe there's a person that I meet in the context of this trial that that's why this trial is so important. Because God's doing something that I couldn't see without being in this trial. And now I see this person that I wouldn't have seen otherwise. So it's important to understand that God is sovereign. He is in control. He is doing something. Uh, he purposefully um, orchestrates our lives to accomplish His purpose. And there's no choice that He gives you. You know, I think, I, I personally believe that God does give you choices, but there's no way that your choice can override His sovereignty that can uh, affect his plan. He's not going to give you uh, A, B, and C and, and then cross his fingers that you don't choose C because that would really mess up his plan. Uh, he gives you choices that fits into his plan. It's important to recognize as we look at our life, we look at all that's going on, uh, we don't see that. You, you see a narrow slice of your life, and it's not the whole story. I, we really don't even see all of our own story, but we certainly don't see all of God's story and all that He's doing in the world. We see only a part of that. And because we see only a part of that, and we tend to put ourselves smack in the middle of it, we often misinterpret things that are going on and things that are happening around us. That's a, a mistake that we, need, we as the church need to come alongside and encourage each other to keep God at the center it's part of the value of the church community. People are going to come with stories and testimonies of what's happening in their life. And we all need the reminder that God is working in this. We don't necessarily know how God is working in it because He doesn't always give us that information. But we can know that He is because He is God. That's part of the definition of God, that He is uh, sovereign, that He is in control. And we don't see the whole story. We don't know how this will turn out, but we can trust Him. We can trust Him to accomplish His purpose in our life. And beyond that, we can trust Him in His purpose in the lives of those that we love. So you have family members that you care about, and it, it's always painful to watch them go through trials and struggles and, and difficulties but to understand that God is in control and He's doing what is ultimately best to glorify Himself and to draw that person to Him. That, that's what He wants. Now, they may resist to the grave, but God does want them to see Him, to recognize Him. And we can trust that He will do what is necessary because whatever pain and struggles we may go through in this life, if we stand before God justified and made right in Christ, it's worth it. And look at the flip side of that. Someone who goes through this life and gets everything they can dream of. They have a beautiful life, no struggles, perfect health until the day they die and they die in their sleep at 110. If they stand before God and they don't have the blood of Jesus covering their sins. They're in a bad place, and nothing in their life was worth it. 
So we have to understand, looked at it from eternity's perspective, the trials of today are short. They may be painful, but they're short. And God's saying they have value because I want to draw you to me. It's also true that the, the trials we face are often, I, I believe, not about us. They're primarily God working in someone else. There are people who watch you, who you don't interact with, but they see how you respond to trials, good or bad, and that impacts their thoughts about God. So I think, personally, a lot of what goes on in my life, God is using that to help someone else understand Him better. So I want to do well, yes, for myself, but I want to do well as a example of what it means to follow God, follow Christ, good or bad, in, in the middle of struggles, in the middle of good times. I want to honor God with my choices, with my life, with my words, because my life's not about me. It is about Him. And the other people who are around me, who are asking, is it worth following Christ? I, I want them to see my life and be pointed to Him and see Him, not me. So often the trials, the, ch the challenges you're facing, I, I don't think they're about you. Uh, they are about God. And the reason you face them is not to make you better. It's to help someone else. So as we look at all these things, one of the takeaways is that he tells us over and over again in his word that those who trust in him will never be disappointed. You're never going to trust God and then come away thinking, well, that was a mistake. You're not going to stand at the end of your life, stand before God and say, man, I can't believe I followed Jesus. <laughs> That's not going to happen. You, you may regret the times that you didn't follow him, but you will never regret trusting him. You can trust God to write your story. Your testimony is an ongoing work. There are pages still to be written. You can trust God to bring you the things that you need, to allow the things into your life that you need to build your faith, to be that person who stands before Him on Judgment Day, completely sanctified, like Christ, and able to say, it was worth it. So, where God has placed you and all of those temptations, trials, struggles that you go through, that's part of the discussion that the local church needs to have with each other. But also as we're working with new believers and helping them understand the purpose that God has, a really good question to ask is, who has God placed in your life? You know, if our life is not about us, it really is about God and what He's doing. We understand that God tells us over and over again, particularly through the life of Jesus, that He, he loves people. Uh, Jesus came to this earth for people, for this work of reconciliation. Um, like Paul, we are to be ambassadors. So who am I to be an ambassador to? It starts in your home with family. And often that's one of the hardest. You know, we have people in our family that, that know us before, <laughs> our friends that we grew up with. They, they knew us before Christ and they knew all of our uh, failures and shortcomings. And often those are the hardest people to talk to. But God has placed them in your life and you have an ongoing relationship with them. And often those are the people who are going to see the, the change in your life in the best way. They're going to see, hopefully, a drastic change from before and after. This is what you looked like before you followed, when your testimony was about you, and then now you live a different life as your testimony is about God, as you follow Him. So who has God placed in your life in your home? Uh, the people who need Him, but that don't yet know Him. What are the conversations that you can have with him. And I understand some of those are very difficult. But the nice thing about family is you often have a long time to work on those conversations. What about work and school? You know, you have a whole another framework of relationships there uh, in your work workplace, in, in your school, in all of the uh, relationships that make up uh your, your day-to-day -day life, really, there are opportunities for conversations in those. How does your testimony come into play? Where does God give you 
openings. And that's one of the things we're teaching people that your testimony, your life change really should impact all of these. So in your community, uh, there's a good book called The Art of Neighboring uh, to figure out what does it mean for me to be a, a follower of Jesus in my community? And then ultimately also in your church. So there's four different kind of circles, uh, home, work, school, community, and church, where you have different relationships and we need to learn what it means to be a follower of Christ in each one of those. So as the church, helping, helping believers grow, part of our discipleship pathway is encouraging everyone to see the relationships around them and bring Jesus into those relationships. And often we struggle, even in the church, you know, we have opportunities before and after our services on Sunday. If you have a traditional uh, church service that starts at 10 or 10.30 Sunday morning, you may get there early or you may stay late and you're just hanging around talking to people. It's amazing how many of our conversations revolve around the weather and football and hunting or things like that, rather than what God's teaching us, uh, how few people really engage in those deeper conversations. Be the person who brings Jesus into that. Share with people what you're reading, what you're struggling with, what you're uh, trying to see uh, God do in your life as you struggle to be more like Jesus. You know, I think a lot of people are open to those conversations. They're just not quite ready to initiate them. So how do we help people? How do we foster that kind of church environment where it's normal to have those conversations with each other? It's one reason why I have encouraged uh, biblical journaling for a long time uh, as you Read God's Word as you chew on it, meditate on it, write down your key takeaway in verse. You're, you have that and you keep that fresh in your mind. And it's a little quicker to come to mind to share with someone else. And if you consistently do that, you build that habit of bringing Jesus into your relationships. And I, I think that's encouraging to other people. It's certainly encouraging to you when you talk to someone and they share with you. And that was really encouraging. So all of this is part of helping each person in the church, as part of their progression toward Christ's likeness, understand that God has placed you where you are for a purpose, and God has placed people in your life that you have an opportunity to engage with intentionally for a reason. You also have, uh, thinking about that last one, the church, we have a, a corporate ministry, both where we serve together outside the four walls and where we serve each other inside the four walls. And really, you know, Jesus said that it's by the love that you have for each other, people know that you are my disciples. The one another's of the New Testament, at least that's what I call them, uh, many, many times where it says something, something, one another. Uh, they give us a good picture of what it looks like to be the church. So we mentioned earlier our spiritual gifts. I think this is one of the contexts where we see those uh, lived out. So one of the most common ones is love one another. I think it's at least 16 times repeated, love one another. Uh, we see uh, things like be devoted to one another. We should stop and ask, what does that mean and what does that look like? How, how am I, how can I be devoted to people in my local church? It says Romans 12, 10, honor one another above yourselves. Like, okay, wow, that's, <laughs> poof, how do you do that? That's the kind of thing that is a struggle, and you're not going to accidentally do some of these things. You're not going to accidentally be devoted to one another. It's part of intentional choices that you make to put Jesus first and to serve one another as Jesus did. Uh, I think as we, together, as the church, encourage one another, we're encouraging spiritual maturity and progress toward Christ-likeness. You know, Paul told Timothy, uh, pursue godliness, pursue righteousness, make intentional efforts so that others will see your progress. I think a lot of these things take effort. Uh, again, in Romans 12 or 16, it says, live in harmony with one another. To live in peace with other people, even believers, take some intentional effort. And I think rather than, like the lower goal is, let's just have peace. But the better goal, we think about Ephesians and Romans 14, 19, 1 Thessalonians 6, 11, is to build one another up. This process of edification would be the big word. Uh, how do we build one another up? I, I don't want just peace. 
I want to grow to be more like Jesus, and I want to help you to grow to be more like Jesus. So how do I go beyond keeping peace and move into helping you grow and mature? And it's not easy. I think it takes some intentionality. Think about harmony. We also have um, accept one another, uh, admonish one another. There's a good one for you. Uh, How do we do that? Well, I think it takes a lot of love and a lot of grace, uh, a, a lot of patience. You know, there's a, a lot of areas where we struggle just with our relationship. Uh, we don't have a deep enough relationship, so we struggle to live out the one another's. It says care for one another. Well, we often don't know each other well enough. You know, bear one another's burdens is one that I often use. If you don't know each other very well, we're going to really struggle to, to bear one another's burdens. We won't know what they are, uh, and we, we won't see a way to do that. We're not going to be able to bear each other's burdens because we don't have the relationship that, that one another is built on. We have uh, quite a few of them that require our relationships to be healthy. So we have forgive one another and then be patient with one another. Uh, be kind and compassionate to one another. So all these speak to a special kind of relationship that we need to have in the church. Uh, We need to honor each other. We need to love each other. We need to uh, forgive. Uh, We need to um, really value that relationship as God does. And that's often hard for us. And again, I think as you look through the one another, you want to evaluate where am I? There's different one another's that maybe speak to our relationship and others that speak to maybe a deeper, more intentional relationship. Uh, Ephesians 5.19, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So that maybe encouraging one another. Um, Philippians 2.4, look to the interest of one another. So I'm concerned that you do well. So often we say, well, it's not my business. Well, in the church, I think it often is our business. We, we need to... Um, be concerned about each other, lift one another up. Uh, Colossians 3.16, to teach one another, comfort, encourage, exhort. Uh, That's another one where the goal is not just status quo. I want you to do well. Uh, Hebrews 10.24 says, stir up one another to love and good work. So I want to, I think another translation says, provoke one another. I, I want to encourage you, stimulate you to do well. To, to love other people, and to accomplish the work that God has for you. Uh, I think that's, it's not always easy, but it's, it's really, really important. Then there's maybe simpler ones that we feel like are less relational, but equally important. Pray for one another, you know, James 5, 16. So all these one another's, and I didn't go through all of them, they're part of what we need to understand in this discipleship pathway we're taking steps toward living out these one another's better. I want to learn to be more like Christ. I want to consider how my gifts build up the body of Christ. So I, I'm part of something bigger than myself. It's not about me. It's about Him. So as part of that, I want to understand what the church is doing. How is the church building each other up? Uh, it, it's good to know what prayer emphasis does your church have? Is there a prayer service you can be part of. How does your church uh, share prayer needs? But also, what is the prayer focus? Is there a forward-thinking prayer focus toward uh, developing pastors or church planting and things like that? How are the one another's lived out? How can you stimulate those to be lived out? And then as the local church, how can we encourage each other to do this well? And one of the ways is things like small groups. You know, I really believe every person can learn to help others grow. This would be individually, in individual relationships, but also in smaller groups or family units. Uh, We all have the opportunity and the responsibility to help others grow. So as a local church and thinking about our discipleship pathway, we want to help everyone ask and answer the question, what is my role in the local body of Christ and how does my church use my gifts? How does my church need the gifts that I have? So this is really part of helping us see we're a special connected body, and it's the body of Christ. And it's important that we see our part in it, that we rejoice in that, and that we lift each other up. Uh, 
The body of Christ is beautiful when it's working well, and it needs you to be part of it. So recently I've been thinking about uh, doctrine and different things. I'm trying to encourage uh, others to think about the main teachings of the Bible. So uh, every month I'm going to focus on a different main doctrine. Today we're going to start the one for August, which is uh, focusing on Jesus. And Jesus as God incarnate is the topic of the day. So Merriam-Webster's dictionary, not always the best one for spiritual definitions, but it gives us one today. Incarnation, the union of divinity with humanity in Jesus Christ. That means he is God and man. That's what we're thinking about when we consider the idea of the divinity uh, and humanity of Christ, the incarnation. A uh, theology textbook that I have is by Miller J. Erickson. I like the way he puts this. At one point in time and space, God entered the world in the person of Jesus Christ as he had never done before or since. The doctrine of the incarnation means that God is in the world and at work there. So it's really neat to think about that. You know, God created everything. And obviously, you know, he talked with Adam. He talked with uh, Noah. He was uh, involved and in the world throughout history. But in the person of Jesus, he entered in a special way, in a unique way, as both God and man. And what that means is, a verse we've already mentioned today, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may receive, uh, obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So here we see part of the result of this incarnation is that we have this high priest who is able to offer a perfect sacrifice. And that perfect sacrifice uh, is because he lived the perfect life in this kind of body as this God and man. And he understands this because he has gone through uh, the things that we have, He knows us. He knows our need. He can relate to us. He is the perfect one to represent us. As God, He's able to accomplish His purpose. As man, He's able to understand us perfectly. Uh, Hebrews 9, 11 to 14 says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? He is the perfect high priest who alone can offer the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Uh, we think about the incarnation. So much of the New Testament and the, the benefits that we have of knowing Christ come from this truth that He is perfectly God. He's not missing anything, but He's also perfectly man. Uh, he suffered. You know, he sweated. He hungered. He understands the trials that you go through. And because of that, He is able to be your advocate before the Father. That is awesome. That should be incredibly encouraging to all of us. Well, how is your church doing at helping new believers collect, connect with Jesus in a real and meaningful way? Are relationships in the church growing and strong, able to handle the trials that always come our way? Well, if we are to be intentional disciples of Jesus, it's important that we make a genuine effort to live out the purpose of the church together. It's not going to happen accidentally. You're going to have to show up. You're going to have to keep showing up. And you have to show up and use your gifts. That means being intentional about showing up and loving the people in your church and thinking about what they need to grow. How can your church be more intentional about helping others grow? Thanks for joining me again today. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, you can listen to all the past shows wherever you listen to podcasts. A good place to start is at runwithhorses.net to find it. 
You can also write me at Norman at runwithhorses.net. Leave a comment on the Facebook page. Take time to pause today and thank God for His work in your life. And whatever you do, keep running.